I want to thank everyone for coming. It's been a long uh, conference, but a pretty good one. Um, the, the last slot of the, uh, the conference. Um, though, uh, before I get uh, into the, the main part of the, uh, the talk, one thing I like to do at uh, specifically Postgres conferences is uh, share uh, two little um, things that I put in my psql rc file, which aren't uh, super well known. Uh, this first one here, uh, on error rollback interactive. Um, now, here, here's a hypothetical situation. Uh, let's say you have a, a big table, you're doing some uh, manual maintenance on it, you do a big update, and it, you, you know, you're doing it in a transaction, sure, but it takes, let's say, four or five hours to finish. And then after that happens, uh, you want to see if you did it correctly. So you do a little uh, select star form users, and, uh, and then Postgres helpfully lets you know that uh, it's supposed to be from and not form. And that's an error, and so it blows away your entire transaction and all that four and five hours of, of computation. Um, a little secret is it's not so much of a hypothetical situation that, that happened to me. And um, so, you know, after that happened, I, was, I started looking around, like, how can I avoid this? And one of my colleagues says, oh, you should use save points. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to remember to use save points every single time I do any statement. Uh, after a lot of digging, it was actually kind of hard to find this in the, the manual, but if you set it to interactive, what this will do is actually set a save point up every time you do a command. And um, the interactive part means it'll only do it for interactive psql sessions. So if you're still piping a script through, you'll get the proper, you know, it'll blow up on exceptions and such. But in intera interactive mode, you save yourself. So now when I typo, you know, commands, which I still do all the time, uh, my transaction is still safe and then I can commit and, and continue on. Uh, the second one, I think this is a little more well known, but uh, like it's still, every time I, I use it, I, it just, I, I'm so happy that it exists, is uh, backslash x, as you're probably aware, will switch uh, outputs from a lot of, you know, being a regular table to having the columns be one per line and then do, you know, several lines. Backslash is auto, I think it came in 9.2 or 9.3, I think 9.3, and if you put this in, it'll automatically pick the right one for you. And so you don't have to rerun queries and, and switch it around. Um, so that, that's my little PSA that I like to put at, to Postgres audiences because those two things have helped me a lot. And uh, I hope if, you, if you're unfamiliar with them, they could help you. Um, so a little background. Uh, I work on Heroku Postgres, which is a, a very large uh, Postgres as a service offering. And I've been there for uh, a little over four years. And in that time, I've seen you know, some terrible things. So like the, the, things, the things people do to their databases is just, uh, <laughs> it's bad. Um, but uh, but from, from seeing a, you know, a bunch of customers you know, grow, uh, grow their data sizes, uh, you know, become, you know, get their applications bigger and bigger, more and more, um, I've seen uh, a lot of different things. I've been able to put some of that back into, uh, you know, by directing uh, Postgres development features, like features that we've sponsored to be built, uh, but also, um, in thinking about a lot of things I see, I was able to put together this talk, and a lot of this comes from uh, being able to be in a good position to see you know, so many different customers and, the, and what they do with their data. Um, when, I, when I was putting this talk together, I was reminded of a story that I heard um, several years ago now, uh, and it really, uh, when, I, when I heard it, it really, it really resonated with me, and so I want to I take some time and share it with you. Um, back in World War II, the Allies would send out these you know planes on bombing missions, and um, you know some some you know some of them would come back, but some of them would get shot down, and you know they you know with the ones that came back they would you know send them out again, and you know some would get shot down and some would come back, and so what, what they started doing was um, you know looking at you know where the planes got shot, and it turns out you know they weren't getting shot all over the plane, they were getting shot you know in certain areas, and so they started to uh, reinforce the armor on the spots that they got shot, which seemed like a, a reasonable thing to do. Uh, but it turns out that didn't help uh, the recovery rates of these planes. Like about the same percentage was getting shot down, even with this extra armor. And it took a little while, but what they realized was what's really happening out there is the planes are getting shot uniformly across the entire body of the plane. And so the spots that the planes, that there weren't any bullet holes, such as where the, the wing connects to the, the body of the plane, those are the places where when they got shot would cause the plane to crash. And so by armoring the parts that they saw bullet holes was exactly the wrong thing to do. They needed to armor the other spots. And um, so in, in this talk, um, you know, I'm going to talk about you know, why you want to keep maybe your data size small. 
um, you know, in, in a lot of the you know exciting stuff that's happening in, in Postgres and other databases is focused on you know, you know, big bigger and bigger and bigger data sets. But um, I think there's some things you can do to you know metaphorically you know armor the other parts of your system that maybe uh, you should uh, pay, you know pay some attention to keeping your data set smaller rather than the effects of what happens when it gets large. And uh, so just a you know quick overview of what we're going to cover is why small data might be important, <clears throat> how to avoid growth uh, in the first place, and if, you, if you're starting to see your things start to grow, how to you know, sort of stem the tide and prevent, you know, slow down that rate. And then uh, finally, what to do when you do get to large data sets. Uh, and that last part, um, uh, you know, many other talks at this, at this conference and other conferences and online focus on that, so I'm gonna only you know, touch briefly on that. The focus is gonna be on the other areas. So yeah, so why why small data? Um, so I, I don't want to I don't want to give the wrong impression. Postgres can handle a lot of data, um, <clears throat> but you know, and often in many cases it's happier. You know, it sort of performs better. Things are easier when there is less data. Uh, also, when I was doing this talk, I found a lot of pictures of baby elephants, and I figured that's like small data. So they'll they'll be here through the talk. Um, so one of the things that um, that you know, the, you know, sort of the, the basic things. That's very easy when you have smaller data. It's much easier to do backups. It's much easier to test the backups. It's much easier to restore the backups. Uh, upgrades are easier because you can just do a, a dump restore. You don't necessarily need PG upgrade, and that's nice because um, you know, unfortunately, today uh, when you do a PG upgrade, you can't get the the newer checksum abilities. Um, you know, and that that you know makes things easier. Um, you know, another thing is when you can keep your data set in RAM. Like if, if your data set, if your machine is big enough and or your data set is small enough that you, you uh, have enough RAM to cover all that, you know, things are like really fast because, you know, anytime you go to disk, uh, it's going to be, you know, orders of magnitude slower than the, you know, file system cache and the Postgres cache. Um, you know, even, even if you do get like crazy like Fusion IO drives, like there's still, you know, there's still nothing like, you know, having everything in, in RAM. Uh, but the real reason is what... Maintenance on larger data sets is uh, is a pain, and um, you know some of these things like you know adding a column with the default, right? Uh, this is this is one of my, my my gripes with Postgres. Like they make it so easy to add columns, but then once you try to do one with a default, you don't really know that that's a problem until the first time you take down uh, your production system. You know, and then you learn, but uh, you know because it's going to have to rewrite the entire table with that default. Um, you know, also uh, adding indexes become harder. It takes they take longer and longer time to uh, compute and to build. They take up more storage space with these larger indexes. Uh, changing data types gets really tricky. Uh, there's a couple data types that you can switch to and keep the same representation, but a lot of them uh, do require a rewrite. Um, and also, it's harder to uh, create followers or, or read replicas. Um, you know, taking a base backup of a very big system, uh, you know, takes you know much longer. And then not only that, but because it takes so long, the amount of wall that you need to replay to have it become consistent, that you know, takes more and more uh, thing. And being able to create uh, lots of uh, standbys, uh, we've found has been um, instrumental in having resilient systems. Uh, one of the things, uh, as sort of an aside, um, that uh, could be you know, an entire separate talk is the idea of like immutable infrastructure. Uh, one of the things that uh, works uh, tremendously well for us is when we, uh, you know, burn a server and you know put a database on it, we try not to, um, you know, mess with it after that point. And uh, instead, you know, when there has to be a new uh, new operating system or, or new whatever, br instead bring up a a new read replica and then you know do a quick changeover. And when you can, you know, make up these read replicas like much faster, uh, it makes it you know much easier to you know work around problems and such. But you know, our customers that you know have you know lots and lots of data, you know. It's all automated, of course, but it just takes longer. Uh, and you know, the truth is, once you start accumulating data, it's hard to stop. Like, you know, he's not going to give up that bottle. Uh, you know, <laughs> um, it's so, sort of like the data takes a, a the accumulation like takes a life of its own, it seems. Uh, and so, if you can, you know, start the fight early, you know, start it today. That's uh, the sooner you start, the sooner it's going to win. And uh, I have one more here with an elephant fighting with a hose. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's get into the, the first area here. Of, like, how do how how to avoid growth? Like, what are some some things you can think about to <clears throat> perhaps look at your systems a different way and 
uh, avoid the growth before it happens. Um, uh, one strategy that um, me and my team we've been uh, sort of developing uh, recently is to always, when you're looking at a new system or an existing system, take some time and think about um, the data flux of that system, like how much data per second is coming in, how much is going out, how much is accumulating per second. Um, you know, for example, let's say you have a table and each row is about a kilobyte and you're getting, uh, you know, a thousand, you know, 1,024 inserts a minute, which, you know, isn't, isn't, you know, screamingly fast, but it's something, you know, that adds up to be, you know, a megabyte of storage per minute. And if you, you know, play that out over time, you know, that ends up being, you know, a half terabyte a year. And, you know, a half terabyte, that's fine. Uh, but, you know, two years from now, it's a terabyte. Four years from now, you know, it's two terabytes. And, you know, if you can, you know, think about your systems in this way, you can sort of plan out, uh, you know, how big is it going to be in the future? Uh, when do you think, you know, when are things going to start to fall apart? When, what are the problems? And, and so on. Uh, one of the things in, in looking at a lot of uh, real life systems is that it really seems that a lot of the data is garbage. Like it's, it's you know, I, I don't think a lot of the data that we store, like we really need to. And you might think about your own systems like, oh, no, no, well, you know, my, my systems, all the data is important. But I don't know, is it? Um, so I want to go, go through a couple uh, instances to, to, to bring it home. Uh, you know, a big one that I see over and over again is uh, like soft deletes or paranoid deletes. And this is where instead of actually deleting the data, you add a, a timestamp column and when it's deleted. Uh, this is, you know, it comes from a, a very good um, desire to, you know, like if a user accidentally deletes the data, they can, you know, you can recover it for them, if not automatically, you know, with a support ticket and work on it. Um, you know, maybe if, if your code, you know, goes haywire and starts deleting things, it's, it doesn't actually delete it and so you can kind of recover. But the problem, the problem with this is it's, it just sits there and grows forever. And you know, everywhere in your application you have to put uh, where deleted at is null. Um, sure, you could have a view that kind of takes that, abstracts that away from you, but it's still like always there. Um, and it, um, you know, the data just, just grows and you don't, you don't notice it until it's too late. Um, another thing that I, I see fairly commonly is people put their uh, logs right in the database, like have a logs table, and that's very convenient, but you know, again, it's gonna just grow unbounded. Uh, the good thing about this is it's fairly easy to prune it as time goes on, uh, though it logs uh, sort of evil cousin, the events table. Uh, this one's a lot harder to prune because um, this might be here for compliance reasons or uh, other, parts of, other parts of systems start to re rely that the event stream is there and starts to uh, programmatically look at it, so it's harder to just uh, drop the, log, the events table. And uh, the next one is like so sometimes it's just, it's not really, it doesn't fall in these other categories, but it's just like old data. It's data you know, that's been around in the system for a couple of years. No one's really looking at it, but there's no built-in way to remove it. And so it just kind of sits there and builds against the walls of your database, kind of like a plaque, and just kind of like, encroaches in and, you know, it restricts, you know, everything else from being nice. The most surprising thing, though, is that I've seen some cases where garbage data is actually the central point of the app, which is sort of paradoxical, but um, uh, often this manifests itself as there being lots of uh, little tables, you know, like a you know, small users table, a small, um, you know, accounts table, and then one table that is just, you know, orders and orders of magnitude bigger than everything else. Uh, an example of this is uh, we had, we had uh, this one company that uh, the point of their app was like a messaging service where you could send messages to other people. And so, you know, they had a small users table and then they had this giant messages table of all the messages, and, you know, which makes sense, but, you know, it's never going away. It's just, uh, you know, accumulating and accumulating forever. And if, if you take a step back and you look at, you know, the usage, you know, their customers, you know, no one's going back years, you know, or you know, even months in the past and looking at the old messages. Like if they were deleted or moved to some other archive service or something, uh, the, the data would be much, much smaller, everything would be, you know, much snappier, and, uh, you know, everyone would be happy. But, you know, instead, like this one table just grew forever and ever and ever. Um, so, you know, with, with those sorts of things in mind, uh, you know, what are some strategies for slowing the growth? Uh, and, you know, if you can't prevent it entirely, how do, how do you at least uh, buy yourself some more time? Again, uh, you know, actually delete stuff. Um, one, of the, one of the big uh, things that makes this easier is having, um, in your application, having 
a way to do background jobs. Um, now, uh, it used to be not as common, but now I see like most apps these days always you know, have a, a built-in mechanism for like background workers and you know, async jobs and such. And if you can do the deletes in you know, the sort of uh, background system, uh, you can you know, finish responding to your query really quickly and you know, get to the work of like, cleaning things up after the fact. Um, the, the problem, the thing that uh, prevents, you know, sort of fights against this strategy, again, is oftentimes uh, compliance or, uh, you know, th there are sorts of uh, regulatory concerns. Uh, so as a, as a way to, um, instead, uh, one pattern that works pretty well is have an, an archive table. And you delete it from the, the real table, but put it in this archive table, and it's sort of, you know, the data is still in the database. It can still, you know, it's still growing there but you know that your main application code isn't accessing that. It's a way that you can sort of have a staging place to then uh, perhaps create an, uh, a CSV and put it on S3 or you know, any other sort of um, you know, file storage uh, you know, of choice or you know, in some, somewhere else. And if you do this sort of pattern of you know, putting it in a temporary place, you still have the sort of peace of mind of you know, should something go wrong, I can get it back really quickly, but then you have a staging place to go uh, stick it somewhere else. I found this and I couldn't find a relevant thing, place to put it, but it was a cute baby elephant eating bananas. Um, so another a common source of where this sort of uh, uh, data comes from often is temporal or time series data. Um, and a really good strategy for dealing with, with that sort of thing is <clears throat> to do uh, table partitioning. Uh, PG Partman is a really great uh, battle-tested like uh, open source tool that um, manages uh, this sort of thing. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have uh, a whole lot of uh, personal experience uh, using this in production. I've mostly just like toyed around with it. Instead, um, we, we recently spun up a service that does this sort of partitioning but we didn't need like, all the knobs and whistles that um, PG Partman has, so my colleague uh, Machek did his own uh, partitioning, so I'm just calling it Machek rotation. And just to, to show how, um, uh, w the first time I heard about this sort of thing, I was like, oh, this seems pretty complicated, but I just wanna show you, it's actually, it's not, it's not too bad. And so the sort of the idea is you, have, you create a type that can put together, a, use a Postgres table inheritance to have a, a parent table and then children tables. And then you create a type to uh, let you bookkeep the identity of these child tables and the timestamp of which uh, they are handling and uh, you know, what, what time they start to handle the, the, the new data. Uh, you create a couple other functions of being able to add a partition. So this looks at the, the parent table and it creates a new child table with the correct time. Uh, drop partition, it'll just drop a table and then the way that it actually works is that the, the parent table has an insert trigger that knows about these, um, all these tables and the current time and can put it in, in the proper spot. And then you can wrap all these up in this, uh, like a massage uh, thing, which you tell it how many tables you want in the future and how many tables you want to keep around like for forensics or operations. And then this uses those other three functions to create new tables and drop them. And then what happens, the, the really nice thing about this, of having it in separate tables, is you avoid a lot of the uh, bloat problems of having one table that is constantly um, getting things added to and deleted, it, de deleted from. And so when uh, these other, other child tables are dropped, uh, you know, it's simply dropped and you don't have to worry about any of the, uh, the bloat issues or vacuuming them. So, again, so, Let's say you know those other strategies didn't work, and you have your your table, your your uh, application is growing and growing. Um, what uh, what you can do here when you already have a lot of data, um, you know, there's, there's still a couple things you can do uh, deal with this. Um, there's a lot of content out here of uh, and, and also solutions, you know, like Citus Data, uh, one of the sponsors here, about how to uh, have a really nice horizontal scale uh, thing. Um, there's a lot of common wisdom around you know, dealing with large uh, data sets. So I'm just gonna touch, touch on a few of these, few of these things. Again, uh, driving home the point, like maybe you can delete it. Uh, I don't wanna be like uh, you know, flippant here or you know, sort of uh, obvious, but um, what, it's, a, it's a simple solution to delete it, but it's not easy. Um, 
And once, once it's already there, um, it takes time to put together a strategy to get rid of it. Often you have to talk with a lot of you know, people in your company, a lot of the you know, product things, because to, to, now you know, your product depends on all this data being there. Uh, an example of this, uh, at Roku, when you push new code, uh, or when you change a configuration, or when you, uh, you know, install an add-on, any of these sorts of things, uh, we create a new release for your app. And what's really nice about this is when, you're, when you, you know, have a problem with some code, you can roll back, like let's say you're on release 100 and there's a problem with that, you can roll back to 99 and it you know, creates a new you know, release 101 with the same stuff as release 99. Um, the problem with this is we store all of the releases forever. And because each of these releases has a copy of the config bars and because we encrypt it, uh, you know, the, these config bars like toast doesn't work anymore. And so this table is just huge. And uh, it's, it's beginning to, get, to become a problem over time. And I've been advocating that, you know, uh, you know for example like this, Yes, you're, gonna, you're probably going to roll back to a couple releases ago, but you're never going to look at your releases from a month ago. Like, rolling your app back a month in the past, like, that's, you know, it's just going it, to, it's really not going to work anymore. And so if we were able to delete that data, you know, and only, and only keep the working set in, in Postgres, you know, we would be able to drop, you know, like hundreds of gigs from that table. But this is, you know, the product um, right now as it stands, it's all documented that you can see all of your releases forever. So, you know, making this sorts of change is going to require uh, documentation change, you know, communication with the existing customer that, you know, we're changing, you know, you, you know an albeit small way, uh, you know, we're changing how the product works and, you know, it gets, it gets tricky. Um, and so, again, it's much better if you can address this, you know, much earlier on in your product's life cycle than, than now because it, it, gets, it gets tricky. Um, another, you know, ob obvious way is, you know, scale up, get a machine with more RAM, faster disks. Um, you know, that, that buys you, you know, actually a surprising, you know, you, you know with, especially if you're on, uh, you know, you know uh, court, real hardware, you can get, you know, some pretty, you know, beefy machines. Uh, but it, you know, it only takes you so far. Uh, if you are in one of these situations where you're doing the soft paranoid deletes, uh, one thing that um, is, I, I I see it surprisingly not often enough is uh, Postgres's partial indexes. And uh, for those of you who aren't, aren't familiar with this, one of the um, you know, really great features of Postgres is when you create an index, you can give it a where clause. And what happens then is the index only applies when that uh, where predicate is true. And so if you create your indexes where deleted as null, not only will the index be um, you know, much more uh, applicable to your data, it also, um, you know, slims down, you know, your index is, is much smaller, takes up less space, and this, uh, this helps a bunch. Um, there's a couple things you can do to delay the inevitable. Um, when, when you are doing those indexes like that, that change a lot, the actual index itself can have bloat. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about, in Postgres, about, you know, table bloat, but we don't give a lot of, ex we don't give a lot of, um, a lot of attention to index bloat. Uh, and one of the things, unfortunately, while Postgres has uh, create index concurrently and, it, and now uh, more recently has drop index concurrently, it doesn't have re-index concurrently. And so this is a, a small script. Um, uh, you know, you don't, like, it, it's open source, you can use it, uh, but you can just look at what it's doing and it's a good strat it's a, a simple strategy of creating a new index concurrently, uh, re uh, renaming it and dropping the other one and so like in one step, you kind of get a nice, compacted, deep loaded index. And um, yeah, th this was made uh, during, you know, some, one of our, um, our, our internal customers. So, uh, so our database service, you know, we have lots of you know, external customers, but the other teams also use us. And um, they are uh, much worse customers because they know where we sit. And they can come up to us and they, you know, so we, we wrote this to, to, help, to help some of them out. Um, you know, again, uh, there's, there's lots of resources out there for vacuum tuning. Um, I'm going to give a, a, a link to, a, I, I, I forgot to put it on this slide, but I have a link to another slide later that has a bunch of, uh, a bunch of queries where you can sort of analyze your, um, your databases for bloat and, uh, you know, tune, tune auto vacuum and such. And, you know, there's a lot of other resources out there, you know, especially I, there was some, some really great talks uh, early at this conference on, you know, database tuning for these. So I didn't want to uh, re-go into them. Um, you know, th these resources are out there. But, um, so I said, this is all just to delay the inevitable. And 
Unfortunately, this, if, if you have an ever-growing database and you can't, you can't stop it and you can't slow it, you're going to have to shard. And um, the, the thing about this is it's not easy. It's, uh, you know, it's, a, real, it's a real pain uh, to implement sharding you know, late after the fact. And all too often I see customers, um, you know, you know, we say, hey, you're going to have to shard. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. And they're like, oh, and they, you like your, your data, you're going to have to shard. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it starts falling apart, and we're like, you have to shard. They're like, oh, we can't possibly. It's like, if you would have, you know, if you start now, so, you know, go, you know, go, go think about the, you know, the, the data flux of your system and look at it. And you, you can, you know, piece out in front, like, how, you know, what's your runway? And you probably, you know, if it is ever growing, you're going to have to start now. Uh, so, um, you know, there's some good resources out there. Uh, one of the things that has made sharding uh, significantly uh, less painful uh, was the addition of the Postgres foreign data wrapper in Postgres, so you can connect out to other, other uh, databases. Um, so this uh, Heroku PG Extras up top here, this is the thing I, I, wanted, I, sh I should have put earlier. It's uh, a nice um, whole bunch of things. It's meant for Heroku Postgres customers, so you can run on your database and see things. Uh, but at its heart, it's basically just a bunch of uh, SQL queries that you can run on, on any existing database. And so if you take a look here through the source, uh, you can find some nice, uh, some nice things to uh, uh, you know, investigate sort of how your system's doing and a, and a whole bunch of nice things. Uh, one of these in here, it, uh, um, while foreign data wrappers are very nice, uh, they're uh, uh, terrible to set up because you have to generate, you, know, for each, you can't just say, give me everything on that other database. You have to say, you have to create a table for each single one. And this is a, SQL, a hideous SQL statement that generates out another SQL statement that you can put in your first database. You know, it's a huge hack, but uh, it works. The other strategy that I, um, I, I, I think is one of the better ones of how to do sharding, if you have enough preparation up front, is the uh, approach that Instagram used. If you uh, Google search like Instagram Postgres sharding, they, they've wrote up um, a number of blog posts on how they did it. Uh, with you know you know specifics and such, but uh, the way it works I think is uh, pretty great. Uh, so what they've done is, uh, in their you know when they just had one Postgres, it had maybe uh, 2,048 schemas, and they treated each schema as a separate database, even though it happened to be on one Postgres. And then when that database got too big, uh, what they did was uh, you know create a, a read replica, um, you know turn it into a fork. And then on one of them, delete the you know low you know you know ones one through 1,024, and then they kept you know 1,025 up, and so that way you know they're able to split it out into two, and now that one they can split out into two, and you know so on and so forth as any one of those gets too hot, and this way you know if you do that up front, you have a really good um, you have you have a good path forward when it becomes time to shard. Um, and I thought that was a really, a really great approach. Uh, and the last sort of uh, sharding that I, I want to talk about, I don't have a good name for it. I don't know. I haven't been able to find it. Uh, because I don't have a good name for it, I haven't been able to find. I'm, I'm sure you know, other people are doing this, but I, I, don't know, I don't know what to call it. So if any of you know what, it's, know what it is, I'd, I'd really appreciate it. But it's the sort of idea that, um, so when I, when I look at some of the systems that I built and some of our customer ones, uh, often I see, um, like two types of tables. One of them is a slow moving, uh, slow moving table. It doesn't change very often, but it has very important data. You know, this is like your users table or your uh, your billings table. You know, it doesn't change all that often. But you know, if you were to lose that data irrevocably, uh, your business is probably not a business anymore. And the other table is, uh, you know, a table that. You know, it's moving very fast. There's data being added to it all the time, data changing on it all the time. But any given row in there really isn't that important. Um, and you can sort of, you know, if, if, if that table, you know, if something happened to it, you know, it'd probably be a big pain, but it's something you could recover from. And when you have both of these tables, like, in the same database um, at the same time, it makes, it makes things difficult. Uh, you can sort of conflate the importance of the two. It makes... Um, you know, prop, you know, usually it's the fast-moving table that's going to cause problems, cause outages on your system, um, and it's hard to you know separate um, 
the, the attention that you need to pay these two things. And so one of the things we've started doing over time is moving these sorts of faster moving tables out to either their, their own database and just have two, you know, two databases on the same app or you know, moving these things out even to their own systems. Um, as an example of this, um, our main app that manages um, the, the central part that started out just as one app that managed our Postgres fleet has now been split out into a couple more apps. And one of these splits was um, for doing uh, observations on the fleet. So now every, you know, every 15 to 30 seconds, we you know, look at each database and look at each server you know, and ask, ask it some questions, you know, do some health checks, do some diagnostics, and you know, we store that data. And so this, these, the table of these observations like just grows and grows and grows and grows and grows, but we really only ever need the last two or three you know, per, per resource or, or per ser, uh, Postgres or per server. And you know, so sometimes you know, we get into sticky situations where we, we saw like a vacuum to prevent wraparound was going for like three days and uh, you know, we're getting close to wraparound, so it's, you know, it's pretty scary. So you know, we were just on, uh, truncating that table because like, you know, we don't need the data but um, you know, it's, it's nice to have. And so what we've, we've done now is put that into its own service and that's where the, table, the mo, you know, Mocheck table rotation came from is making that system you know, really good at these sort of high rate um, things. Um, now this, it's not to be taken lightly, like uh, we've been working on that for you know, quite some time. It's hard to you know, split that out after the fact and keep everything you know, running at the same time. But um, being able to look at your database and you know, think about these two things in parallel, um, you know, these two different kinds of tables and looking at it through that lens uh, is a pretty good way of uh, splitting things out. And so, you know, just to go over, you know, re recap here, uh, you know, we talked about like why you would want to keep your, your database small, like how, you know, Postgres behaves better when it is, you know, at smaller sizes, how to prevent growth and in those ca in cases when you can't, how to slow it, and then how to deal with, uh, you know, larger data sets as they grow. And you know, again, like if if the data set is large, you know, dealing with those problems still feels, you know, some, sometimes that's inevitable. Sometimes that's just how it has to be. But I think a lot of times it is sort of, you know, putting armor on the bullet holes that are there, and not really, you know, the the underlying thing that you know can be addressed. And uh, thank you very much. I'm gonna get a beer after this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's that, that, yeah, that's definitely um, that, that's that's why it is harder to. So the question was uh, just, just to repeat it. Uh, you know, what what about strategies to store more data to keep track and point and say that this data has never been used? Uh, yeah, like <clears throat> that's that's why that's one of the reasons why it is harder to uh, start dealing with this after the fact while while it's there. Like it's much easier to you know fight it early. Um, yeah, in those cases. Um, you know, it's, it's definitely a, a good strategy. Um, like, an, a, an easy way is to just add another column, right? And, um, you know, last access to that timestamp, and like, that's, that is more data, but it's not, like, that much more data. Uh, one thing I actually did do is, um, it wasn't so much for, in the case of deleting um, data in, you know, to, to case for deleting things, but um, more of to kill a feature. Because um, we have this one thing where you can uh, uh, sort of, give read-only access to your semi-technical folks and they can write reports and import, you know, import the CSVs into like Google Drive or whatever. And one of the features there is exporting to a Excel spreadsheet, but I'm like, we have CSV and I don't think anyone's using this. So I actually, you know, added a thing to keep track of who downloaded what. And like that, that does help like then you can have to, to go, go away from the hand wavy to, uh, you know, concrete data. Yeah. Yeah. So really, the argument you want to make is that I want to delete everything past the point, not you know, these records. Right, yeah, so yeah. You, just, you can keep it really simple, really small, and say, okay, everything past the point is garbage because it hasn't been accessed in two years. Done, and, and it's proven. 
Mm -hmm. and, and at the same time, you're not increasing your update volume and you know, you know, creating bloat. Because obviously that can create bloat as well. Not yeah, that's that's a, that's a good that's a good strategy. And another thing that I, I did find help is you know in these sort of negotiations like let's delete this. It's like um, people react poorly, you know, other stakeholders react poorly to uh, let's just delete it. So if you can say like, let's archive this and put this in the system that, you know, we can get it later, but you, you'll never get it. Like, it's just gonna sit there. Um, but but that, that usually helps us sort of like a, you know, here's, here's, a, here's a cancellation thing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the, the lot, lots of, um, unfortunately, I, I don't have a, a good answer for the tables with lots of columns. I haven't myself uh, ran into that, so I, 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 I'm sorry, I, I don't have a, an answer for lots of columns. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And, and so they're not there, they're, they're no longer needed. And so how do you find all of those tables and then get rid of all of those? Yeah, no, I, 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 I definitely, I can, I can appreciate that situation. But um, one of the, um, you know, our, our customers are usually um, start out as Greenfield apps. So I haven't, I haven't seen many people, like my, I, I know that that, that that situation exists, but I just haven't been in a position to um, observe that. But I can definitely see how that's, a problem. All right. Thank you.